Between roughly 1890 and 1937, the Supreme Court decided a string of decisions that made it very difficult or even impossible for the federal or state governments to enact certain types of economic reform legislation. During this period, many laws that we take for granted today were held unconstitutional. Things like minimum wage laws, child labor laws, or laws protecting job opportunities for members of labor unions. This period of judicial history is often called the Lochner era, in honor of a prominent due process case. But in fact, the Lochner decision was just one part of the puzzle. We can begin with the power of the federal government. To enact any law, Congress must be acting within one of its enumerated powers, represented here by the vase. Now, during this time, the Supreme Court interpreted some of these powers quite narrowly, meaning that Congress had overstepped its authority. Of course, the absence of enumerated powers would not affect state-level lawmaking, because states may enact laws on any subject. But when states passed certain economic reform laws, the Supreme Court held that they violated a different principle, protection for individual rights, which are represented here by the face. Specifically, the Supreme Court found that many of these laws, such as minimum wage laws, interfered with freedom of contract, which the court believed was a form of liberty that was protected by the Due Process Clause. The remainder of this video focuses on the logic behind the limits on federal lawmaking power. As noted earlier, the theory used here involved a narrow interpretation of the enumerated powers of the federal government. During the Lochner era, a majority of the Supreme Court ruled that many frequently used enumerated powers, including the Commerce Clause, the Taxing Clause, and the Necessary and Proper Clause, did not extend as far as Congress believed. The majority rulings in these cases were, of course, based on a belief that the relevant powers were, in fact, too narrow to authorize the laws that were being challenged. But it's also important to consider why the court thought this sort of narrowing was a good idea. Majorities of the Supreme Court thought, as a general matter, that the states should have more power and the federal government should have less. Part of the majority's reasoning involved ideas that can be seen, among other places, in the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment, which was ratified along with the Bill of Rights in 1791, dealt with a fairly narrow question. That is, since Congress only had power to legislate in certain areas, who had power to legislate in the others? The answer was pretty obvious. States could. States have authority to legislate on any subject, including subjects where Congress also has enumerated power. But during the drafting of the Bill of Rights, the question was posed by several states. So in response, Congress proposed the language that we now know as the Tenth Amendment. It indicates that leftover powers that had not been given to the federal government could still be exercised by the states or by the people. Because this was a logical result of the structure of the Constitution, James Madison, who wrote the Tenth Amendment, said that the provision may be unnecessary, but it couldn't do any harm. Against this backdrop, the Lochner-era decisions limiting federal power can also be seen as decisions to guarantee state power. Remember that whenever Congress enacts laws, they will be supreme over conflicting state laws. As a result, when Congress has less power to enact laws, there will be fewer federal laws that might invalidate conflicting state laws. There's a reciprocal relationship between the powers of Congress and the supremacy limit that applies against the state. Another factor that may have motivated some Lochner-era decisions is the impact of a federal law on individual rights. Any law that the federal government cannot pass means one less law for individuals to obey. So in some sense, reducing the power to make laws enhances individual liberties. Of course, individuals would still need to obey state law, so this was ordinarily a subsidiary concern. Debates about the scope of federal powers were nothing new. They had existed since the nation's earliest years. So the Lochner era was just another phase of this eternal debate. But we should recognize that it's a debate that involves the power of federal courts just as much as it involves the power of Congress. 
When John Marshall was Chief Justice in the early 19th century, some people advocated for a very narrow view of federal powers so that Congress would have less authority to act. This approach was known as strict construction. If it was adopted, strict construction would give a large role to judges since it becomes their job to be skeptical of what Congress is doing to keep Congress in check. The contrasting view saw the enumerated powers as things that implied greater authority for Congress. And in turn, that calls for judges to be more deferential to legislative decisions. This was the view adopted by a unanimous Supreme Court in McCulloch v. Maryland. The McCulloch idea did not completely go away during the Lochner era. In fact, during this time, many federal regulations were upheld in some opinions that were quite consistent with McCulloch and Gibbons. These included decisions upholding a federal power to ban the interstate shipment of a number of items, including lottery tickets, spoiled eggs, and prostitutes. Meanwhile, other kinds of economic regulation were found to be too far removed from enumerated powers, even when those regulations had effect across state lines. These included decisions involving monopolies that violated federal antitrust laws and interstate sale of goods that were manufactured with child labor. The results in cases like these raised the question, was the court shifting its basic approach to judicial review? Perhaps it was getting more skeptical across the board.